Hello, everyone. Hi, Professor. <laughs> Feel free to speak Good up. Morning. I don't mind if you leave it unmuted. Of course, if you got background noise, I understand that. Uh, hold on a second. I just realized something. Very back. <laughs> that would have been bad, or at least embarrassing. So uh, last weekend, I was, or weekend before last, I was <laughs> working out in the yard and I uh, had to untie a knot. And I unwisely, like my mom, my wife, and every other woman in my life told me, don't use your teeth to untie that knot. Well, I untied that knot and broke my tooth right at the gum line. So this is actually a fake tooth now. <laughs> Big guy right in the front, so I look pretty goofy. Uh, so my, I got a little bit of a lift as a result of having this thing in my mouth with this fake tooth until I get my new implant. So I apologize for that. Uh, like I said, I understand if you guys uh, keep everything muted because you got noise going on in the background or whatever, uh, and that's fine, but you can also keep it on. I want you to ask me questions as we go. Uh, I'm usually fairly, I try to make these things as fairly interactive as possible. And if we get too diverted, like we're asking too many questions that are going in places that aren't that helpful, I'll say, well, let's save that till afterwards or something. But uh, as far as it goes right now, just uh, I want you to speak up whenever you have a question. Uh, I'm Billy Younger. I teach physics and astronomy here at TCC. I actually teach uh, math as well at other places, but not here at TCC. I've been teaching math, physics, and astronomy for, mm, well, for about 20 years or more. And uh, we're going to learn Physics 202 this semester, which is mostly about electricity and magnetism, but we also cover quantum mechanics and special relativity and a little bit of general relativity. Uh, I hope all of you've had a chance to download my uh, uh, syllabus and the instructions on how to get into mastering. Anybody had any difficulty with that? And you can chat if you don't have a, a speaker yet. You're welcome to put, uh, put it in chat and I'll see that. No good. Well, that's good. It sounds like everybody's doing pretty well. Make sure, make sure, make sure you get in that immediately, like today, because you got homework due on Monday at 9.30 a.m. So make sure uh, you get in there. Even if you don't yet have an account, like you took the course somewhere else, the 201 course somewhere else, uh, they give you a trial period. I think it's two weeks, but it's two weeks from the time I started the class, which was, I think, Friday. So you got two weeks from this past Friday. Uh, that's free. So you don't have to miss homeworks and stuff like that, even if you don't have the, the finances yet or whatever. But you do definitely have to have a mastering account. Uh, since I do on uh, occasions allow, uh, on our online test, I allow you to use open book, open notes, uh, but there's two major tests, a midterm and a final, that you're not allowed to use that stuff. You're just allowed to use an equation sheet that I give you. So you definitely want some copy of the book or a book like the one we use. Uh, but if, if you really want to go on the cheap, probably the cheapest, cheapest, cheapest way is to go straight to the Mastering Physics website and buy access there. Uh, that gives you access to the ebook, which some people don't like, and I understand that. Uh, but you can get the ebook and access to the website for probably the cheapest price there. Uh, it's, it'll be added, they add like, 20 some percent or whatever if you go to the student store though i had some slightly lesser amount if you go to another bookstore uh but if you really 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 want a physical textbook uh there's really not that much of a difference between the seventh edition which is what we're using and the sixth edition or even the fifth edition so if you just want a physical text to read you get all you need out of the older edition far as the reading material goes just the examples might be slightly different or if i ever assign a problem out of the end of the chapter it might not correlate with the right one, uh, but you can get that from the e-text anyway, so that's no big deal. Anyone have any questions on that? All right, I thought I'd take a second and go over, by the way, uh, I sent an email out last night, and I suspect most of you've gotten it, uh, but basically it's telling you that our class was originally scheduled to have lab first and then lecture, but that was mainly because we, you know, we had room constraints when we switched to uh, synchronous online, all the room constraints disappeared. There was no problem anymore. And it's almost crazy to have a lab before a lecture. I mean, it works. It's just uh, not usually the best way. And the main reason I switched is I now have the uh, great internet connections unstable. 
Uh, I now have the lab course at the end part, which starts at noon, and the lecture por portion at the beginning that starts at 9.30 a.m. The reason being is I generally will take all of the time for lecture unless I give you some assignment outside that, that sort of accomplishes the same amount of learning time. Uh, but lab will often, you, you can be done, sometimes students will do the lab before they even come uh, to lab, in which case you can leave a lot earlier. So if I, if I book the lab at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the class, then we could possibly get out early, whereas otherwise you just have this big gap in the middle and you have to wait around till lab time. So uh, if no one has any problems with that, I'm gonna go ahead and proceed. Uh, if you do have a problem with it, please uh, email me and we'll, we'll work that out, talk, discuss it or, or whatever. Uh, but I, I generally have never had any problems with this, uh, switching them. Uh, so hopefully it'll work out for everyone. Does anybody have any questions about that? This is what the textbook looks like if you bought a physical copy. It has a cool mountain on the front, it's Gian Coley. Uh, he's a pretty famous author. He's written uh, this book as well as the calculus-based physics book. Uh, it's, you know, any book that's in a, a edition like five or higher, you can, you can uh, pretty well assume that they've been run through their works and they know what they're talking about. It's a pretty, pretty decent assumption. That doesn't mean a first edition isn't that great. Uh, sometimes they're almost always filled with, with little typos and stuff like that, but other than that, they're usually good content. But just about any book that you find is an algebra-based physics book, it will be infinitely helpful for you uh, in this course. So you can use that textbook or some other ones. Uh, I was wondering if I had any up here, but I think all my physics books are elsewhere in my office, for instance. Yes. Uh, one thing you might look into, and I would say this is awesome for all of your courses, is something called a SHAUM, S-C-H-A-U-M, SHAUM's outline. They're yellow and blue, and they're made in that creep, creepy, crappy uh, newsprint paper. Uh, there's one for college physics, and that really is the best one. There's one for science and engineers, but I don't even recommend that to my calculus-based physics students because it's not nearly as good as the algebra-based one. Uh, but what that does is it sort of has a chapter corresponding to every chapter in your textbook, but literally the chapter is like two paragraphs long. And then the rest of it is all solved problems. Uh, you know, they'll state the problem, they'll state a way they're going to uh, solve it, then they'll write out the solution in, in some uh, great deal of detail, and then they go to the next problem. And literally it just gives you a lot of experience and practice looking at problems, so you can almost always find one like uh, the problem you've been assigned. So uh, I definitely recommend you guys getting a copy of that if you have any problems whatsoever. They're usually 13 to $21. When I bought it, it was like $9.95, but you know, I'm like a thousand years old. Uh, so I'm sure they're more expensive now. Uh, but they are worth having. If you, if you find you're running into difficulties with this course, I'd recommend getting one. Uh, or if you're just independently wealthy and can spend your money on anything, then go for it. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, what I'd recommend as far as uh, help goes. Uh, I'll also be posting videos. I'm slowly creating a YouTube presence and just putting a mess load of videos up there. I'll be putting a lot of videos up, including uh, this one. And you can always go to that site. Uh, you can even, if you want to, uh, you can subscribe to it. Uh, I'll have a link to it. Uh, but you can subscribe to it if you want to, and it'll even give you messages when I post something new. But a lot of that stuff's astronomy, some of it's calculus-based physics. Uh, it'll have a little bit of everything in there. And it's really not that great yet, but like I said, as we're going along, each time I stop and solve a problem, I'll post it there, and then you guys can look at it and find some uh, help with it. Now, uh, I think the next thing I need to go over is really uh, basically our syllabus. So yeah, I posted it on Canvas already. So let me share my screen and talk to you a little bit about it. It's not that complicated that my physics uh, ones are pretty straightforward. My astronomy ones take a lot of explanation, but I just want to go over a few things here. So let's do, I guess it'll be that one. So I'm sharing my screen. I'm going to my actual class. Get this out of the way. Uh, so hopefully y'all can find, uh, identify who these four people are. I know you know that one, but the other one's probably more obscure. But anyways, I'm going to our course now. 
and down. You'll notice the way I've got it organized is this is what's the top of every uh, Canvas course, the stuff that the college puts in. Uh, the next line, the next module, and they, these are called modules, by the way. Uh, the next modules are course documents. So you'll see the syllabus is there, the student reg registration, that's how you get into mastering. Uh, if you haven't already, but the, the big deal is do not, do not, do not go to the website. You want to go right here where it says my lab and mastering. You click there. It's going to make you create account or if you have an account from last semester, maybe even the semester before, it depends on what kind you bought. Uh, you can use that old account. You might have forgotten your password, but you can go through the forgot password uh, process. I don't have any way of accessing that. So if you've forgotten your password, if it doesn't give you enough to do the changing of the password, then you're gonna have to contact Pearson. But that's where that instru those instructions are. This is the lab syllabus. It's really short, it just tells you what labs we're planning on doing in what order. And this is the lecture syllabus, and that's the one I'm really shooting for. You'll notice the next thing, we'll have all the labs. There's one just called labs, and that's where I'll post the labs as we do them. Uh, today's lab, for instance, is spreadsheet review, which if you had this last semester, you've probably already done the spreadsheet review, but you're going to do it again. Uh, so today's lab will be pretty straightforward and, and quick. And this is week one. These are things you can't see. We're going to go over this today as part of our make sure you understand the concepts. Uh, this is the PowerPoint that the author gives out. I don't use PowerPoints for this course, but sometimes students like to use them to take notes. So you're welcome to uh, if you want. So that's why I put them there. And I've got a couple of videos up that I'm going to show you. Uh, and this is basically where everything will be. Uh, but right now I'm going to go ahead and go to the syllabus, the course syllabus, not the lab syllabus. And I'm going to go over that. Actually, I might as well download it. It'll be bigger this way so I can show it to you. Okay, so uh, the one I emailed out, I had forgotten to change my phone number to, to the other from the other instructors. So this one is the correct phone number. This version that you see now is actually more correct. And I've got to go back, I'll change this. I've got to go back and change this to say lecture here and to say lab there, okay? So again, if, if anybody has a problem with me switching the lecture to the uh, after noon part and the lab, uh, or the lecture to the morning part and the lab to the afternoon part, please email me, let me know. Uh, but generally speaking, I'm gonna assume that, uh, that everybody's okay with that and we're gonna keep on moving. Uh, this is not the website that was just automatically pasted into there. Do not go to there. That's why I sent you out that other thing. Just go straight like I showed you in the Canvas. Click on my lab and mastering up in the top left corner of the Canvas page. That's where you wanna go. Some of the main things I wanna hit on in the syllabus is this right here where it says instructor email, W Younger at TCC. I, you need to email me whenever you have a problem or whatever, but the key point is one, you have to email me from your TCC account. I'm probably not going to even see your email if it comes from an account other than the TCC Gmail. Uh, two, you also have to start your subject line with PHY202. If that's not in the subject line, my filters are probably going to throw it out and I'm never going to see your email. Three, uh, include your first and last name. So what make, makes it worse is students don't use their TCC email, which is you know hard enough to make sense of because it's like three letters and then some random numbers of your student ID. But if a student uses like little bug at Yahoo, then I open it up and they don't have a name. They'll say Sarah. Well, I got like 84 classes and 84 Sarahs. Not really. It's obviously an exaggeration. Uh, but the key point is that if you don't put your name in there, I'm going to have a hard time knowing who you are. So make sure, make sure, make sure uh, you, one, email my TCC account from your TCC account. Two, you start your subject line with PHY202. I, I didn't put a space in there. So make sure you don't either. And three, make sure you include your first and last name. Uh, so the required text are principles with applications, uh, Gian Coley, Pearson, Prentice Hall, 2014, which is the seventh edition. It's obviously a six year old book. Uh, you can probably find copies of it for fairly cheap, at least in the sixth edition, if not seventh edition. Uh, 
the learning outcomes are right here. That's just generic stuff we, we put in there to make sure you know what the outcomes are. Uh, topics covered are right here. We actually do notice cover electricity and magnetism to some extent. Uh, then we do a little bit of light, but most of the, what we do with light is done in our lab. We do very little material in the lecture portion, but then we jump to special relativity, quantum mechanics, and nuclear physics. So there's some uh, pretty cool stuff covered. Uh, homework will be submitted electronically, so you don't have to turn anything in unless I make some special assignment. Generally, you just do your homework in mastering, and it automatically puts the grade up, and that gets copied into my grade book on Canvas. That's the beauty of me doing the integrated system instead of you having to go to the separate website. So for each chapter, there will be two to three homework assignments. Uh, some chapters have two sets of problem assignments. Most of them just have one set of problems. Uh, but I do one set of problems at least and one set of concept questions. And uh, you'll see those. They're already posted for Chapter 16 and for Chapter 17. Uh, they're due at 9.30 a.m. Uh, Monday. So they're due by the beginning of class next week. And that's the way all homework assignments will be. Every time we finish some stuff, that chapter, once we finish that chapter, that will be the due the following Monday. Uh, there will also be practice tests for each test that will count as a homework assignment. So what I do is I actually make a practice test from the bank that I use. And usually what happens is you probably have two or three, maybe four problems in the practice test and you have a very limited amount of time to do it. But if you took it an infinite number of times, you'd probably see every question in the test, but I guarantee you'd see 90% of the points from the test. So I put those up just as a sort of extra help for those students that don't quite uh, get how the tests are made up. So if you, once you've taken that practice test, you know what types of questions you, you will see. Uh, they're all multiple choice. Uh, if you have to spend much time looking up answers, then uh, you're probably gonna fail the actual test because uh, you just don't have enough time to look up maybe more than one problem. Uh, when I do my online test, not the midterm and the final, when I do my online test, I allow you to have access to your textbook, to your notes, uh, to any other book, and even Google searches. The problem is I give you such a small amount of time that if you have to look up more than one question, you're probably going to run out of time. And if you basically are really fast and able to do that, uh, it's still going to kill you on the midterm and the final, and those are a big chunk of your grade. So uh, that's how I uh, try to compensate for the fact that I have no idea who's taking your tests until that midterm and final, and that midterm and final where each count is like 20%. So you're looking at 40% of your course grade comes from two tests where you're going to be on video. That's why you have to have a camera. You have to have an internet camera on your computer to take this course or you have to have a separate attachment that uh, can be used as an internet camera uh, to take this course. So make sure you have that. Uh, you will be being filmed and monitored uh, by Respondus and me during the midterm and the final, but all the other ones are just uh, you taking tests, uh, you using your notes, you using a book, but you're being mindful of the time so that you don't run over it, okay? Uh, the practice test will allow an infinite number of attempts. Uh, there will be no penalty for the first two late homework submissions in both the uh, concept and the problem categories, but any further late submission will be counted at 50% of the raw score. So late submissions will only be accepted up to one week past the original due date. So make sure, make sure, make sure you don't miss assignments because they are a percentage of the course. Each test will consist of probably five problems and three conceptual questions. That's generally how I do it. I might change, but we'll see. But I'll, I'll let you know before you take the test what it's gonna be, but that's normally the plan, is five problems and three concept questions. Uh, online tests, like I said, are open book, open notes, open internet, with some rules. Uh, the, the rule mainly is if I open the test, uh, let's say on January, or excuse me, July 17th, uh, I usually give you three or four days, maybe even a whole week to do the test. And I usually only give you one attempt. Sometimes I give you more, but the main thing is if that test opened up on July 17th, you can search the internet anywhere you want. The only thing you can't do is uh, look at the internet uh, on a page that was created on July 17th or later. Okay. So that gets around people, you know, quickly making up a web page to make uh, 
to basically expose my test. <laughs> uh, you can't, you know, interact with a person in real time, so you can't send text messages back and forth, uh, that sort of stuff. That's not supposed to be done. Obviously, that everybody knows that's cheating. Uh, can I check it? No, but my general <laughs> understanding is there's always somebody that's going to bust on somebody. So just uh, don't do that. Uh, and like I said, if you're not learning the material that well, the midterm and final is going to hurt you really, really badly. The lowest online test grade will be dropped. Uh, your midterm nor final will be dropped. Though. Those are definitely a, a done deal. Okay. Uh, if you're absent for a test, the test will count as your drop test grade. If you're absent for a second test or more, uh, you need to contact me, but probably I'm going to drop you. You, you miss more than one test, that's really bad. You miss a test, that's really bad to begin with. But you definitely need to get up with me uh, it, within 24 hours if you miss a test. And either I will choose to allow you to make it up by me giving, making up a new test that I can't guarantee is going to be equivalent, or I might substitute your uh, test average for the missing test. Okay, but missing a test without contacting me is uh, grounds for withdrawal. I, I don't want to withdraw draw anyone from the course, but that's what happens. Uh, I've ha once had a student tell tell me they skipped the test because they quote unquote were not ready, which I get. I've been tests that I weren't ready for, but you, you don't get a special break because you weren't ready while every other people had to be ready. So uh, that's not a valid excuse. Valid excuse includes, uh, and it's at my discretion, by the way, but a valid excuse includes uh, you got in a car accident uh, where you can provide a police report, uh, timestamp photos, that sort of stuff, uh, along with you know driver's license, license plate numbers, stuff, so I can verify that that is in fact your car, or you're sick and you got a doctor's note, uh, death in your family, that sort of thing. Those are the really the only reasons you should ever miss a test. And not only that, when they're online, other than midterm, I usually give you several days to take them. So, uh, you know, if you wait to the last day, uh, that's going to be really your problem. So I, I would definitely not wait to the last day to take the test, even though that last day is there. As far as the mastering physics goes, again, this website just automatically got traced into there, but you can go there to purchase the book and everything. So it's still helpful to know where that is. Just we're not going to access your homework from there. That's the main thing. Make sure you do not go there for your homework. In fact, to do so, you'd need the course number. And I distinctly do not give you the course number uh, because it will mess everything up. Like literally your grades will be lost. So, so just don't do that. Always go through the uh, MyLab and Mastering link in Canvas, except like I said, if you need to go purchase the uh, right to access mastering physics and the ebook, and you want to purchase it directly from the publisher, uh, you can use that website to look for it. Okay. Uh, if you were registered last semester and maybe even in the fall semester, your uh, my lab and mastering account it might still be valid. Uh, it if you used a different textbook, even if it was a Pearson, it probably isn't valid. So if you came from another school, in other words, that was using a different textbook, it probably won't be valid. So you have to buy another. But if you uh, came from TCC uh, last semester or maybe even the fall semester and we're using the same book, then you should probably uh, be able to access it. Uh, if it was the fall and you have problems, that might just be that you uh, the pass you bought was only good for 90 days or 160 days or weird times like that. Okay. So I recommend that you sign into Mastering Physics. Uh, actually, this is not Mastering Physics. I recommend you sign into uh, Canvas at least every other day. Uh, so that's another boo-boo I got to fix. The other instructor who gave me his old syllabus uh, used only the Mastering Physics page. He didn't use Canvas at all. So that's why you find these little quirks. But I use Canvas and never use Mastering. So anytime it says you have to do this on Mastering, you have to do something, just think immediately, I got to do this through Canvas. This is, notice our class meets on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It's supposed to be 9.30 to 12 for now la uh, lecture, and then 12 to 2.30 for lab. These are the actual chapters that I, uh, and chapter sections that I've planned on covering. So like today, I'm supposed to go up through 16.6. Uh, next time will be 16.7. In the ideal world, it would be best that you've already read this material before covering it. Uh, the, the best way to, to learn physics is by, one, doing a buttload of problems, but two, you've got to learn how to read your textbook. And that's that's true for all college graduates. It's, uh, it's a major skill to learn to read a textbook and then apply what you learn in it. 
that's what the employer that for some odd reason wants you to have a college degree, even though you've been doing a job for 10 years uh, with no college degree. And all of a sudden he wants you to go back and get a college degree. That's why your job often requires it because employers often expect you to be able to take a white paper that their company puts out. You read that white paper and then know how to implement it. Uh, that's a skill that you learn in college. No matter what your degree is, you almost always learn it if you went to a decent school. Uh, so that's part of the deal with this course is you're learning how to read and learn from reading. That being said, reading a science book is really, really hard and different. Okay. I've, for instance, uh, been teaching this 20 or more years and every semester I've read the textbook twice by the end of the semester, even though I've you know been te teaching it for this long. So if you can't get it in one reading, say, duh, okay, I can't get it in one reading and I've been do doing it for 20 years. So expect to read it a couple times. But that being said, most of you will read uh, maybe two pages and your eyes will start to glaze over and you'll start thinking about uh, what you're doing this afternoon or having to wash your car or some essay you got to write. Okay, so that's your attention span to some extent. So what you need to do is get an idea how long that is. So like start reading and literally set a stopwatch and find out how long you can read before you get bored and lost. When you do that, uh, record that time. Okay, so maybe it's, let's say it's eight minutes. And, and that's not abnormal, by the way, if you're only got an eight minute attention span, that's pretty normal for students coming straight out of college. Uh, so what you wanna do from there on is maybe the next 10 times reading, I want you to read for eight minutes straight and then just put the book down, go do something else, uh, maybe look at some problems that we have to do, or maybe do an entirely different subject. Come back, read another eight minutes, okay? So what you're gonna do is do that maybe 10 times, or if you need more, do it more, but then I want you to try nine minutes. And then I want you to try after maybe 10 times, try 10 minutes and slowly build your ability to read, even stuff that's most boring, like I practice with read manuals. Uh, to, to make myself be able to read anything. So you should be able to read any kind of junk. Ideally, as a, as a college educated person, you want to be able to read for two hours straight. But for this course, I'd say an hour straight is the minimum. But try to get you up to an hour straight of reading without losing attention span and that'd be great. Now, some techniques you can use to keep your train of thought is whenever the author is writing something, you want to think back and forth with them, try to think, oh, well, let me think of a counter example of what they said, or let me think of an example that supports what they said, or let me predict what they're getting ready to say, and let me look for a counter example or something like that. So if you do that little game of playing back and forth, and when you run into something that seems nonsensical, reread that sentence. If it still seems nonsensical, jot it down in the margins or on a separate sheet of paper and mark the page number maybe even mark the part in the book where it says that and make sure you find out the answer to that question. So be an active reader. That'll help your attention span as well. So that's about it as far as the uh, details on how to be a better reader for science, but I, this will help you a lot, a whole lot. So uh, try to do it. It's going to help you for all your courses. Uh, so anyways, this is the sections we're going to cover as we go. You'll see, I basically have a test, a test every week. And these online ones, they end with OL, they're basically gonna open on Friday and usually they're due uh, either Monday or they'll do the following Wednesday or something like that. So you get a good chunk of time to actually take them. Uh, the midterm's gonna be different. Everybody's gonna take it at exactly that time. So on the midterm, you're gonna have to do it this way. So uh, basically you're, you're gonna take that on uh, from 9.30 in the morning till noon and actually, uh, it might even be less time, but that'll be how much, uh, what time you got to take the midterm and the final exam the same way. It's going to be at 930 in the morning uh, on, on this Friday as well. So this is roughly what I plan on covering in each of the chapters. So, you know, our first test, which is a week from Friday, uh, will cover 16.1 through 16.9 and 71 through 17.5. So almost all of chapter 17. Attendance policy, I didn't even mess with this, so this is old face-to-face -face lecture stuff. The deal is uh, you need to attend or your, your, things are gonna happen and it's gonna be really bad. This course is tough face-to-face -to -face, 
uh, online, it's even harder. So you really need to attend. I'm keeping roll. If, if you miss three days in a row, I'm going to drop you. Okay. Uh, actually, if you miss three days period, I'm, I'm going to drop you unless you contact me and say, Hey, I've got this stuff going on. I'm keeping up with the videos that you recorded and posted online. Uh, but can you please help me? Uh, don't drop me. I, I can usually accommodate that and I will do my best to do so, but trust me, three weeks is equivalent. I mean, three days is equivalent to a little bit more than, th uh, three weeks in a regular class. So missing a single day is a bad, bad thing. So try not to miss any uh, any meetings at all on Zoom, okay? All right, so that's about it. Uh, as I said, do try to read the material before we cover it. Uh, most of the stuff I'll be changing. When I do make any changes, I will uh, post a new version of the syllabus and I'll have a date on the end. And the one with the latest date is always the most current one. Of course, I can't change it after the drop date because that would be like violating a contract with you folks. So all the changes have to be made really soon. Uh, as I said, the tests will count 20% total. So if you look up here, it looks like we're gonna have uh, one, two, the midterm I count as test three, uh, test four. So I'm gonna have three tests and I'm gonna drop your lowest. So two tests are gonna count as 20%. So each of these tests is worth 10%. If you look at the midterm though, the midterm is going to count 15%, one and a half tests basically. The final is going to count 15%, one and a half tests again. So you're basically looking at 30% of your course grade on those two tests. Those are the ones where you're going to be videoed and all that stuff. Okay. Your homework, which is all that stuff that you're doing through mastering, but through Canvas, that's worth 15%. And your conceptual homeworks are worth 5%. Your lab grade is worth 20%. Uh, some labs will have lab reports where you turn in uh, a formal report. Some labs will have you just turn, uh, basically you turn in the sheets that you downloaded for lab with your answers in them. And some labs will require you to maybe take a quiz or something like that. Uh, basically everything that you turn in, I'm gonna add those up and divide it by uh, the number of things you turned in. And that'll be 50% of your lab grade. The other 50% will be attendance. <laughs> Okay, so if you attend all the classes, you automatically get 100. But the downside is if you miss one class, you've dropped down to a 90. Okay, I'm going to take off 10% for every lab you miss. And obviously, once you've missed three labs, there's no way you can get any better than a 70 uh, for the lab portion of the course. So that, that would be bad. Uh, the last day to drop with a tuition refund is July 13th. That's Monday. Uh, the last day to withdraw without getting an F uh, is 7:29, so July 29th. So this is the date, 7:29, by which I have to have the, all the syllabus changes made. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that? I have a question, but I feel like it's kind of dumb. No, that's fine. There's no dumb questions in physics. Only dumb so people. I know. I know. You know. COVID-19 and all that, but do you think there's any way you could do like study sessions or something at the TCC library before a test or? Uh, that might be possible. Uh, the only downside right now is one, if, if the most effective way to have a, a, a group session like that would be as many students as possible, but that's the very antithesis of, of what we're supposed to be doing for social distancing. Yeah. But it, I might be able to schedule something in it. Uh, the, to be honest with you, when I do schedule something like that, it's such a low turnout, I don't think it would be a problem. And if we do it in the classroom, uh, that would actually be big enough where uh, if 10 people show up, I could still have more than six feet between each of them. So, yeah, I will consider that. Uh, and I'll see if I can fit it in once a week. And we might even be able to do something where, uh, where we can count that as some of the time. So I know you guys don't want to spend two and a half hours or excuse me, five hours straight on a Zoom meeting every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So when we do that, I can count that as part of our lecture time. So I'll do my best to, to do that. Uh, it will not start till next week, I'm certain, uh, but uh, I might be able to do that. And I'm gonna have to find out if, uh, I'm gonna have to find out something that sort of fits everyone's schedule uh, so I don't have to do multiple ones. The only reason uh, I don't really wanna do multiple ones, I, I don't live like, right down the road from school. I literally live in North Carolina and it's uh, uh, over a 50 mile drive. 
So uh, I would prefer to do it once a week uh, as opposed to, you know, two separate meetings or something like that. But we'll see uh, if you guys have any specific times that uh, you can't make it because you're actually in class and you can't make it because you're uh, scheduled for work. If y'all want to send me those, I might be able to weed through that and see a time that's useful for everybody and uh, fit that in. I doubt it because there's 20 some people here, but I, I might just have to just say, hey, I'm going to do it this time and you do your best to get there. Okay. I will try. And who was that that asked the question, ma'am? Me, Riley. Riley. Okay. It's, it's Thank you. How do you pronounce your name? Is it here, Brant? Yeah, here, Brant. Sounds kind of German. Cool, cool sounding name. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? I'm sorry, I didn't hear uh, if you said this, but the expected last date of the class, what is that supposed to be? Uh, August 14th. Okay. Yeah, it's really fast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, my school's starting two weeks early. I go to ECU, so my school's starting like um, two weeks early, so I start August 10th. Ooh. So um, would the final be given like, like how the other tests would be like yeah it's still days. online you just like i said you have to have a, a internet cam because we have a, a service called respondus uh where it actually watches you and i have the option to watch you as well taking the test so you'll have to be on camera and it looks for any suspicious moves like someone always looking off to the right or looking down right. like this or something and if you see any of that weird behavior, you're going to assume to be cheating or something. So uh, you can take it anywhere, though. So that's the cool part, even though I didn't realize ECU was starting early, but that makes sense. I, I heard they were trying to uh, make sure. They yeah, they're ready. having it. So our last day of the semester is before Thanksgiving. And we have like two, like we don't go back till January 19th. Cool. Uh, what's your major there, if you don't mind me asking, JC? Uh, biology. Oh, cool. That's right next to my physics department. I did my undergraduate and master's at East Carolina and the biology yeah. building was part of the physics building. They yeah, they're connected. Is it still there? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah it won't be a problem at all. It won't be a problem at all. The only thing is your obviously your transcript won't come immediately before classes start, but I'm sure you're not taking something that this is a prerequisite for. No, no, no. no. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I have one question. Yes, sir. Uh, is the final going to be cumulative? Yeah, uh, pretty much all our tests are cum cumulative. Uh, that's just the way physics is. But I try not to dip back in the past too much. So, uh, but here's the problem: like inevitably, you'll have a problem where you know, hey, find the force and acceleration of an electron, and then I'll ask you how far would that electron go after three seconds. Well, all of a sudden, we're doing kinematic equations from the first semester. So uh, that's the downside. Uh, but generally speaking, I try to not go that far back too much, but you still have to know adding vectors and subtracting vectors and multiplying vectors by scalars. You have to know how to solve the problems of uh, F equals MA. Uh, and once we get to the relativity or to the optics and to the relativity and quantum mechanics, the electricity and magnetism questions stop. But the final and midterm are basically very much comprehensive. They're gonna have everything that preceded them. Okay. Test one will be just those topics covered. Test two will just be those topics covered. But the midterm and final will be everything before it. Thank you. No problem. If I change that, I'll let you guys know too. Sometimes I do, I'll just on a whim change it to make it a little less comprehensive for a final, just because the course is six weeks long, right? So if I do that, I'll let you guys know with plenty of warning. Uh, anyone else? All right, well, we've gone uh, basically 45 minutes already, and that was just covering the syllabus. So what I think I should do is probably give you guys about a 15 minute break. I'm going to pause the recording and give you a 15 minute break. So let's say, it's actually be a little bit more, let's say uh, you pick back up at uh, 1030. Uh, I'm gonna be sitting here reading and drawing and, and calculating some stuff, but you're welcome to ask me questions during that time. But if you wanna go get a drink or something like that, that's certainly fine. I'm just gonna take about a 15 minute pause for you though. Thank you for letting me know.
thank you for letting me know that I had that boo boo in the syllabus. I, I'll find a bunch more, I'm sure, too. Every time I make a syllabus, even after I go through it four times, I still find four more errors. So, uh, if if there is in fact, and I'm, I trust that you're right, if there is in fact 10%, it'll be equally divided amongst the midterm and final. So. Thanks for letting me know that. Uh, yes, Shom's outline is what I was mentioned. There's one called uh, College Physics. Uh, the other one is Physics for Scientists and Engineers. So make sure you don't get that one. That's the calculus-based one. And like I said, I think the other one's just called uh, College Physics, but it might be uh, General Physics, but I'm pretty confident it's uh, College Physics. They, I keep them in my office. In fact, you can see there's one. I just saw it over my shoulder. Oh, uh, yeah, here's one. So here's a Sean's outline. I, I use them a lot. So I keep uh, keep them in my office at work, but this is the one uh, for quantum mechanics. And this is what the modern one looks like. This one costs $14.95, but you can see if you open a chapter, like chapter four here, that's the whole chapter is those three paragraphs. And then everything else is just solves problems. So they're wonderful books. They're written by good authors. And in fact, sometimes you'll find that the actual author is an author that wrote one of the textbooks that you uh, that could be used for your course, uh, stuff like that. But I definitely recommend them. Uh, don't go spend the money if you find that physics is easy, unless you just like having books. Which that's how I got my uh, grotesque number of textbooks, uh, books in general. Is I just buy books because I love them. And I love reading them. But if uh, I'm not saying you need to buy that for this physics class to survive, I'm just saying if you have problems with physics, or especially if you had problems last semester, uh, that might be a good addition to your library. And you could probably sell it on eBay or something later if, if you, uh, once you're finished with the class. But I actually found them very helpful. Uh, I didn't discover them until my third year of undergraduate in physics. And one of my uh, instructors uh, that I wasn't taking at the time, loan one to me. I was like, oh man, where have these things been all my life? So hopefully that'll help you. Uh, so yeah, that's the Sean's outline. And I think I got everyone else as far as their questions. So what I thought I'd do now is give you a, a little uh, story about how we started studying electricity. And I say we, and I mean people a long, long time ago. So the ancient Greeks actually noticed that uh, when tree resin dried, uh, it became sort of a, a solid that was sort of like glass, but it was it had a yellowish hue to it. Uh, that is actually something we call amber. And the Greek word for that is electron. Uh, so they noticed that when you rubbed a, a, a amber, in other words, uh, basically hardened tree resin, when you rub that with wool or uh, some kind of fur or something like that, basically what you'd find is then the wool and the and the amber would attract each other so they knew something weird was going on there they could feel a sense of force to it you could hear, even hear popping on occasion stuff like that uh, so that's where we get the origins of the word electron electricity electronics all that good stuff all came from the idea of amber well in the 1700s people started studying this way more rigorously and they discovered that certain things uh, when you rub them together they behaved a certain way but if you rub two different things together they behaved a different way and stuff like that so like if you take glass and you rub it with uh, fur uh, you get a, a charge on both the fur and the glass but when you rub amber with fur you get a charge on both the uh, amber and the fur but they're different charges from the amber to the glass and that's not easy to tell necessarily uh, it's really hard to tell which one's what, but in the end, when you think it out and you work it out through all these different materials, what you ultimately decide uh, is there's only two flavors, if you will, of charge. Uh, ben Franklin came along and decided to char call them positive and negative. Uh, ben Franklin was known as a great uh, uh, scientist as well, actually more uh, in some sense as a scientist than he was even as a diplomat, but he was a, a big diplomatic figure in the U.S., uh, and he was stationed in France for a long period of time. So he actually got to uh, do scientific work that was immediately recognized as opposed to the stuff he did when he was in America, which uh, the Europeans being where the world center was, if you will, uh, didn't get to hear that information. But 
uh, ultimately Ben Franklin did determine uh, which one would be called positive, which one would be called negative. And under that scenario, basically what he chose is uh, whenever you're rubbing glass, for instance, on fur that glass would become what we now call positively charged and when you rub the amber on fur that amber would become what we now call negatively charged uh, that ultimately leads to what we call know of as current so ultimately when we learn about batteries and wires and resistors and stuff like that there's going to be a flow of charges going around a circuit and the way he had chose that positive charge it turns out that we generally think positive charges are rolling out from the positive terminal of a battery around a wire through a light bulb and then back into the battery. Uh, in fact, that was exactly wrong. It turns out the negatives are the one that's moving around and they're going the opposite direction. But the good news is there's only really one experiment you can do that tells the difference between those two. That's called the Hall effect. And you can pretty much pretend that the positive charge is flowing around is the way it works and it works out just fine. So we're down to this point where we have uh, two types of charges, a positive and a negative. Uh, you can actually determine that with something called an electroscope. And an electroscope, you can even uh, determine uh, how big the charge is. So if you charge something up with, a, a, a say, an amber rod with some fur or some wool or something, then you can uh, tell how charged that is compared to something else. So you can hold it up to an electroscope, and electroscope does something, and then you hold uh, something else up to the electroscope, and it does that thing, but it does it more severely. And you say, oh, well, that second one must be more charged. So let me give you an idea of what an electroscope looks like. I'm going to sh uh, show my dot cam. And I have on this dot cam some terms uh, for starters. So let me first off let you all get a sight of this. Now remember this is all being recorded so we actually have a chance to uh, go back and look at this later. But I uh, wrote at the top some terms that you should know. Electron came from uh, the Greek electron which obviously we'd be using the Greek alphabet at that point. Uh, and that is the word that the Greeks used for amber. Okay, there's some words that we'll need to know. Induce, which is related to induction, and conduction uh, is a different term. You'll need to know that. Conductor, insulator, semiconductor. Uh, you'll need the concept of charge, of conservation of charge. You'll need the word ion, uh, the word polar and polarization. And ground is another term that you need to know. Uh, Coulomb's law will be something we'll discuss in a second. Ben Franklin, I just mentioned him. Uh, and these constants over here, the Bohr radius, the uh, quantum of charge, this is the magnitude of the electron charge, that's why I put the vertical bars around it. This is the Bohr radius, that's what Bohr predicted to be the radius of the hydrogen's uh, ground state orbital. This is the mass of the electron, which you can make use of, and this is the mass of the proton, that's a three there. I you're kind of bad. This is not Mickey Mouse. This is a water molecule. And this is sort of the Bohr model of the atom, or well, actually it's what we call the planetary model of the atom. But the reason I'm showing you this really is this thing to the bottom left. This is an electroscope that I made. Uh, it's a drawing of an electroscope that I made. But basically you can take like a planter's peanut jar and you can drill a hole in the top. And you can take a little piece of copper wire that you can get from Home Depot or you find laying around somewhere in a house that's just been built. Uh, you'll find bare copper wire. And that bare copper wire, you could actually use a uh, wire with the housing too. You just need this end and this end to be uh, unhoused. As long as you kept the ends uh, bare, that and that, it'd be fine. Uh, what I did was I bent it into a sort of, sort of little spiral up at the top and then ran it through here and then made a little hook. And then I took two little sheets of aluminum foil and cut them in little rectangles like that. You see the little rectangles and you poke a little hole in it just big enough for uh, it to fit over the wire. And you put those two little pieces of aluminum foil in there and you now have a ultimately cool fancy electroscope. So what happens when you actually put a charge near this is uh, basically that charge distributes all the way down onto these things and then those spread apart. Uh, which brings us to the next uh, idea that we need to understand. And that is that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. So uh, what you can do is you can, for instance, charge that amber by rubbing it on fur and then hold it next to this electroscope and what'll happen is a charge will be induced 
on this. So what happens is that uh, the amber, which I told you would be negatively charged technically, now that is causing this end to become positively charged because it's close to it and all the negative charges are gonna uh, run away from the negative amber. And that leaves all the positive charges on this end but that shoots down here and causes all these little charges on the end to be negative. So now the two aluminum foil flaps are negatively charged and they spread apart like that. If it's a big charge, it'll spread apart a lot. If it's a small charge, it'll spread apart barely. Okay. So you can see that would happen. Uh, now, if you actually decide to touch this tip with that amber that's charged, what will happen is that charge will leave the amber and some of it will actually go onto the actual metal. Now the entire metal will become negatively charged. Okay, so it still acts the same way, only now when I remove the amber, the flaps don't go back together. Before, when I just held the amber near it, if I move the amber away, the flaps would come back together. But now, if I actually touch it, it's going to deposit some of that. Now, amber is not that good of a conductor, obviously, so only a little bit will go, but some of it will go to here, and this will become negatively charged, and then that negative charge will try to disperse itself uh, as far away from each other as possible, so this end and this end will all have charges on it, and these little flaps will stick out. Now, if you come up and take another thing, let's say a piece of glass or plastic that you've rubbed with fur, if you hold that near it, if it's the same charge, it should make those flaps spread apart, apart further. But if it's the opposite charge, it should actually do something different. And it turns out it is the opposite charge. So you can actually bring in the plastic, which now is a positive charge. And what's going to happen is it's going to uh, attract all the positives this way, which means more negatives go this way. Uh, so ultimately, uh, uh, excuse me, when I bring in the positive, it's going to force all the negatives up this end to be attracted to it and cause all the positives to go down here so those flaps will come closer together. So that's how you could actually use an electroscope. If you know one thing is positive, you could tell with an electroscope that something else is negative or if something else is positive. So if I brought something the same charge as the amber, it would cause them to spread further apart. But if I brought something the opposite charge, it would cause them to recruit, uh, reduce the gap, uh, gap between them. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Uh, you can also work out that, you know, a force hanging from a string, uh, or excuse me, a mass hanging from a string with a little bit of charge on it, the tilt of that is, you know, related to uh, how strong the force is, and that force is called the Coulomb force. So in principle, the larger the, the separation of these, the larger the force, and therefore the larger the charge. So in that way, you could actually figure out exactly how uh, much charge is on something. Well, not exactly how, but what you could do is easily figure out when something is twice as charged as something else or four times as charged as something else. And that's how uh, Faraday and Maxwell and all these uh, great minds put together the laws of, of electricity and magnetism that ultimately Maxwell understood deeper than anyone and put them all together and made them into four fundamental equations that still uh, can solve the vast majority of electric electricity and magnetism problems uh, that we encounter. Uh, there's only small changes to it due to quantum mechanics and stuff like that. So uh, Maxwell really, really uh, figured everything out in the uh, 1800s. So it's really amazing. Now, Maxwell's an awesome guy. He actually uh, held the same position that uh, Isaac Newton did at Cambridge, the same position that later Stephen Hawking held and so on. Uh, but he sort of, it was a sad case. He died very young of stomach cancer, just like his mother. And uh he sort of died without the respect of his peers because they sort of always looked down on him because he was the second Wrangler at Cambridge. Uh, the first Wrangler is, uh, check this out, this is really crazy, but when you go to Cambridge back then, and I'm not sure it's still the same way, uh, but back then uh, you didn't have tests, you just had courses and the courses would have instructors that taught you things and then you'd try to you know, solve problems and stuff like that and you could ask them for help from time to time. But at the end of the, your years of college, they would have one grand Wrangler exam and it would sort of test you on everything. And how well you did on that was sort of, you know, how good you were. And then they'd take all the tests once they were graded and they'd post them on the wall in order of the first Wrangler, which is the highest score, and then the second Wrangler, third Wrangler, and they listed them all by name. So everybody knew how well or how bad, bad you did compared to everybody else. Uh, and the point was that Maxwell came in second. 
the other person, by the way, is lost to history. I looked his name up once and I don't think he did anything else very major, but this is one case where the first Wrangler did not uh, turn out to be that awesome, but the second Wrangler did. Uh, but still that stench was stuck to him. That taint, if you will, was stuck to him. Uh, so a lot of people thought he was a little bit of a nut, but he turned out to be brilliant. He was the first person to explain what the rings of Saturn were. He explained how uh, molecules and atoms behaved, uh, even though we didn't necessarily know they existed at the time. And then he basically unified electricity and magnetism, showed their two sides of the same coin, uh, and did so in a, a way that mathematically was beautiful and perfect. And that also uh, sort of got up the ire of a lot of people specifically because it was a branch of mathematics that probably 10 people in the world knew at the time called vector calculus. So uh, he was really a brilliant guy and he's a big figure. His name's James Clark, James Clark Maxwell, but in Britain they uh, spell Clark, C-L-E-R-K. So anyways, that's the, uh, how we get to where we are in electricity. Once you have a ratio of charges, you can start to uh, actually consider how to measure this new force. Obviously, like charges repelling, that means there's a force from one charge to the other that's causing the two to repel. So you can go ahead and start figuring out, well, what's the magnitude? And what does the magnitude of that force depend on? And what's the direction? And that's the kind of stuff that Coulomb and Maxwell and people like that did. Uh, but before I do that, uh, before I go over the Coulomb's law, what I want to do now is share my screen again. And I think it's this one. I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to show you some uh, some actual short videos that give you an idea of what induction is and conduction and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to look down. Notice we got our course documents, then labs, then week one. Uh, and in week one, I actually had a video posted here, electrostatic charge. I actually posted two, but only one popped up. That's why I've got studio over here. But I'm going to show you this one uh, real quick. This is a series of videos that MIT put out. By the way, MIT has put like all their courses online. So if you're not uh, skilled enough like I wasn't to go to one of the premier universities in the, in the world, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, you can still take the same courses that they have there. Uh, you can take them at other universities, but you can go online to uh, MIT's website and they actually have all theirs online. Sometimes they even put up their uh, uh, syllabuses, their assignments, the textbook they use, and you can basically get the equivalent course. So it's really a, a great uh, democratizer of education. So if you're not wealthy enough or if you didn't do well enough on that SAT, uh, to end up at Caltech or MIT or UC Berkeley, you can uh, still enjoy the education of that by watching these things. So these are just some videos that their instructors and students use, but this one's really awesome. Uh, it's actually short, so let me show you what's going to happen. This device right here is called a Van de Graaff generator. See Van de Graaff. Uh, basically, you could make one yourself. Uh, really, all you need is a monk, uh, a motor, or you could even take a monkey on a bicycle, for instance, would work fine. Uh, main thing is you need something to pedal. Okay, and down here at the bottom, you'll have a little spool, and that spool was made like out of uh, plexiglass or something. And then you have a large rubber band that stretches around that spool and goes all the way up to another uh, plexiglass spool, if you will, inside of this container. Now, just as a matter of that plexiglass and that rubber uh, spinning a, adjacent to each other, that actually induces a charge on the actual rubber band. Uh, so it's just like you rubbing your shoes on uh, the carpet. Basically, your shoes are going to steal electrons from the carpet. And that's what's going on here is the rubber band is stealing electrons from the uh, plexiglass spool. And then it runs up here. Well, inside of here, there's another plexiglass spool, but there's a little piece of screen. And that screen has little tips of wires that act like lightning rods. And those charges basically uh, are electrons. And those electrons cause the little tips of the uh, lightning rods to become more positive because it forces the negative charges to run away. So all of a sudden the little negative charges on the rubber band are attracted to the positive end of the little lightning rods and it jumps from the rubber band up to the little screen lightning rods. 
that little patch of screen is attached by, attached by copper wires to the inside of this aluminum ball. And because they're all negative charges, like charges repel, they want to get as far apart from each other as possible. So they spread themselves uniformly across this whole thing. And the longer you let this go, the more charge builds up. And in fact, you can charge this up so much that you get tens of thousands of volts on this thing. Now, the cool thing is I do this demonstration in my class all the time. Uh, the cool thing is that it really does not deliver much current. So it's not that unsafe. I mean, it, it hurts when, when this lightning bolt attacks you <laughs> it's it's a little bit painful but it's not deadly so it's a nice demonstration so what he's going to do here is he's going to let this fanny graph uh generator which i just told you how it works he's going to spray some confetti on it and uh or lay some confetti on it and watch what happens then i'll explain it okay i don't know what happened let's try this ah it won't let me do it okay not a problem I tried to video it through here to make life easy, but that's okay. So that's my YouTube channel. Uh, <laughs> didn't mean to go there necessarily, but you can look me up for Billy Younger if you want to go there. I've got you know lots of videos and lots of different stuff there. Uh, but let's do a search for uh, MIT confetti. There it is, that's the video we're gonna watch. I don't know if this full screen will let me have it, let's see. Nope, it will not. Maybe, nope, it, yeah, it will. Can you all see this? Okay, so there's the confetti. This little thing right here is a grounding rod, so it's connected directly to the, the little circle at the bottom of your light receptacle, not the two slits, but the circle. So he's keeping the charge zero because it's running straight to ground until he lets that off. Now you see all the confetti goes flying. And by doing all that that way, he keeps from getting shocked, which is really boring. I, I prefer to get shocked myself. Uh, let's, let's stop this. Okay, so that was a demonstration of basically uh, the Van de Graaff, when you connect it, uh, it builds up a charge. If you have the confetti laid on it, the confetti is basically paper, so it's a, an insulator, uh, so it doesn't really readily get charged, but it does take some. So what happens is all the negative charge that's building up on the uh, Van de Graaff is also distributed to the individual confetti. So now you got two negative charges next to each other, so the, the confetti shoots up in the air. So that's a demonstration of charge by conduction because the actual Van de Graaff, which was the thing that had the charge and was gaining more of it, was literally touching uh, the confetti. And since it's touching, you can actually conduct the charge. So that's a, a, a charging by conduction. So because they were like charges, like charges repel, and you could see, in fact, the force was pretty large because it was able, even though it's on the order of, you know, electron charges uh, charging up the little confetti, still you were able to shoot the paper, which obviously has a weight way bigger than electrons, uh, shoot it up in the air for a good height. So that's how that, uh, that particular demonstration worked. I'm gonna go back to the modules now because it seems that my studio plan to show that is not gonna work. Uh, I was trying to give them credit by calling it MIT, but uh, it's better that I just go straight to there. So that's one demonstration. Now I'm going to show you another one, and this will be inducing charge, and I'm going to pause it several times. Uh, let's see if it's one of the ones that pulled up here. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. Ah, there's the one. Okay, so this one's really cool. Now I'm going to walk you through it. Everybody can see this, right? Anybody not be able to see it? Okay, so there's the Van de Graaff, told you how that worked. There's a conducting rod. There's the grounding rod. So let me show you what this means. So this is an insulating rod. 
Uh, so it's basically black plexiglass. It's got two little strings, which are obviously non-conductors. And it's got a non-conducting rod between them. And these two things on the end uh, could be conductors, or they might even be one conductor and one not a conductor. Doesn't really matter uh, which one's which, because no matter what, when you get something near a charge, uh, it's still going to induce a charge in that thing. So for instance, this thing's going to have a buttload of negative charge. This guy right here, because it's near it, all the negative charges in this end are going to try to run to that end to get away from the negative charges because like charges repel. That's going to make this end, in fact, positive, and that's going to make this end negative. Since it's a conducting rod, those electrons are actually free to run over here, and it will actually make this side negative and this side positive. Now, he's going to take this thing, which is isolated, so it has essentially no charge on it right now, and he's going to hold it near it and even touch it. So let's watch this. So now what he's done is put them there. Notice it's actually touching. What's happening is this thing is actually charging up this device. In other words, it's making this end more positively charged, this end more negatively charged. So this end's now going to be positive end. And since it's touching this ball, this ball is going to become positively charged. And since this ball is touching this one or this end is touching this one, this one's going to become negatively charged. And since this is a non-conductor between them, no charge is really going to go back and forth. A very small amount, an infinitesimal amount maybe, will go around. So this end is going to maintain a positive charge, which is attracted to this. And this end is going to maintain a negative charge, which is repelled by this. And now you can see that in demonstration. So let's watch the video. He's actually moving it around about equidistant away. You see how it stays radially pointed? He had to go slow to show it, but it does. And that's because the white ends always uh, positively charged is going to stay pointing towards the negative Van de Graaff because that side's attracted to it. That's charged uh, by conduction over here, but this was charged by induction. So this device was charged by induction, but these were charged by conduction because they touched it. But once you separate it, it maintained the charge. Now, this is a really cool one. So what we have here is uh, one of those Mylar balloons, and they're side, sort of aluminum looking. That's because they really are a metallic conductive type surface. So he's actually going to uh, basically induce a charge in this uh, balloon, specifically by it being near this charged Van de Graaff. So let's watch it. So this is something you want to think about. Can you guys think about why is it bouncing? Why did it run towards the Van de Graaff to begin with? And then why did it touch it and then run away from it and then touch him and then run away from him? Anybody think they have any explanations that they're willing to share? It's kind of a long wordy thing, so I wouldn't expect students to normally answer this, but I did want to give you the opportunity if, if, if you think you could. All right, so here's what's going on. So initially, remember this thing's sort of conductive, uh, even though it's attached to a string, so none of the charge can go anywhere, any charge it has on it. So its net charge initially is probably zero. So it's grounded, or it's not grounded, but it's initially zero charge, but it's a, a, away from ground, so it can't, touch it, it can't distribute any of those charges. But when it's just sitting here, this thing starts building a more negative, 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 negative charge. Well, that takes the side of the balloon closest to it and makes that become positively charged because it's running the electrons away. So the other side of the balloon becomes negatively charged. So it becomes polarized. So that's that word polar and polarized. Whenever you have opposite sides of different charges, uh, that's called a polar object. Uh, the water molecule I showed you earlier is an example, uh, uh, basically because the electrons uh, in the oxygen are held more tightly because it closes the outer shell, uh, completes the outer shell of the uh, 
oxygen. So those uh, negative charges stay around the oxygen more often than they come around the hydrogen. So the hydrogen has a negative end of water and the oxygen has a, uh, or excuse me, a positive end and the oxygen has a negative end. So it's a polar molecule. Well, the same thing happens with this balloon. The left hand side becomes uh, positively charged. The right hand side becomes negatively charged. So it's positive, this is negative, it's attracted to it. So the balloon goes, wow, I'm really attracted to that. Comes over here and gets closer and closer and closer. And as it gets closer, the force gets stronger and stronger and stronger as we see when we learn Coulomb's law till eventually it touches it. Once it touches it though, then some of this negative charge on here is delivered to that. So it's actually trying to basically take half the charges on here and put on there and leave the other half on the Van de Graaff. But the Van de Graaff is constantly making more, so it'll get more negative later. But in general, if you turn the Van de Graaff off just before this happened, what would happen is half the charge of the Van de Graaff would go to there and half would stay on the Van de Graaff. Uh, that's because conservation of charge uh, dictates that the charge can neither be created nor destroyed. Now the thing has an actual net negative charge, right? So this thing continues to charge itself up. It's now uh, uh, repel repelled by it because they're both negatively charged. Even if it didn't charge back up, it would still repel from it because it's still negatively charged, but it's even getting stronger. So it's gonna rapidly run this way. And in fact, when it comes this way, it's gonna see ground. And in fact, his body is gonna become somewhat polarized. So it's now negatively charged. He's, uh, his atoms and molecules around this area are gonna become more positive and the negatives are gonna run away. So now this negative charge is gonna to run to him and touch him, but he's actually connected to ground. So when he does that, the negative charges go, jump from here onto him they shoot down the ground. Now this is back to basically neutral again. So it sits back to where we are. The same thing happens again, it comes back and does that. Does that make sense to you folks? It's a long complicated process, but it's uh, the individual parts are straightforward. Anybody have any questions on that? Now, once you understand that, you can understand the rest of this video. So I'm gonna let the rest of the video just run so you can appreciate it. Uh, what they're going to do. They're going to actually make an alarm system out of it, for instance. All right, well, this is talking, I've mentioned the word ground a couple times now, so I want, to under, want you to understand what that means. So if you look at your light receptacle in your wall, it'll have two vertical slits, one slightly longer than the other, and then a circle. Uh, they're usually, for some reason, put with the slits on top and the circle on the bottom. Uh, a careful electrician will often put them the other way around because it's actually a little safer if you put it the other way around with the, with the circle on top and the slits on the bottom because that circle is in fact the ground, meaning that's a safe haven. If you've got a buttload of charge, you can stick it in that ground, then it'll take as much as, it, as, much as you give it uh, because basically it's literally a wire connected to the earth. And the earth is this big repository. It's got an infinite supply of positive and negative charges essentially. And uh, no matter how many charges you put on it, they're gonna run down to this earth. Uh, you can literally go outside of your house or your apartment, find out where your panel is for uh, where the electricity comes into the apartment or to the house, and you will find a wire that runs out of that panel and connects to a copper rod. They're normally eight feet long, and they're driven directly into the earth. It's just a long copper rod. You bang it with a hammer straight down into the ground, and then you connect all of those little circles of all the receptacles in your house to that one rod, or sometimes you have multiple ones, and that's what ground is. So when I say something's grounded, it means in some sense it's connected to the ground, so any charge it takes is going to just suck it up and throw it uh, down towards the center of the earth. All right, let's go on with the video so you can understand that now.
So check out what, what's happening. This sphere, this negatively charged sphere is the way we're thinking of it. We're thinking the electrons are being pulled uh, off of the individual plexiglass spool onto the rubber band, and then those are being delivered to this. So this is negatively charged. Uh, that's a conducting rod connecting these two bells. This is a non-conducting rod connecting this bell. Uh, and this is a non-conducting string connecting these two metal uh, balls. So what happens when this one gets negative, it's gonna cause all the negative charges in here to, re to be repelled. They're gonna actually run down here and go to this one. So this one's gonna be negative and this one's now gonna be positive, all right? So this, this bell is actually attracted to this thing now because a charge has been induced in this entire system and this part's actually repelled from it. Now this little chunk of metal is gonna sort of do the same thing. All of a sudden it sees, hey, this charge next to me is in fact uh, positively charged. So this guy is gonna say, well, this half of me, the right half of me is gonna turn negative and the left half of me is gonna turn positive because it's isolated, it don't really have a net charge. Uh, so it's now going to have the negative half on, uh, on, well, this is going to be turned positive. So the negative half will now be, uh, the side closest to the bell and the positive half will be the side farthest from this bell. So now I've got a negative next to this positive. So it's going to attract it. It's going to pull it this way and go bang, hit it. That's going to deliver. Uh, some of those charges basically from here to it. So this was positively charged. Now this thing's got a net positive charge and it's gonna induce a charge in this. Uh, and this side is gonna actually become slightly, uh, slightly more negative to get away from this positive charge that it has. Uh, now it's attracting uh, this object to this bell. So it's gonna ring over here and that's gonna deliver its positive charge to this. So this, now this guy is now positively charged. The same thing sort of going on in here, uh, so you can actually sort of make it out, but it's a, a combination of charging by induction through here, uh, across this distance, and by conduction when they actually touch. And that's it. Uh, at MIT open, uh, it's OIT something, this is the name of their website. Really wonderful, I have a ton of videos. That one with the guy looked like he was screaming just now. Uh, that's uh, Walter Lewin. I think he's now finally retired, but he does all sorts of cool physics demonstrations in front of his class at MIT. Uh, I think there's a book uh, written by him called For the Love of Physics, where he talks about all his demonstrations and stuff. I definitely recommend you checking out that uh, website whenever you're looking for any topics. Uh, go to MIT's or just go to YouTube and do a search for whatever topic you're studying in physics and then type the MIT after it and you'll find all sorts of tons of great video uh, content that they put up. So, uh, We've now sort of covered the topics, the main concepts of this electric charge. Uh, so it, there exists two types of charge, positive and negative. Uh, it turns out Ben Franklin chose which one was which. It turns out the electrons ultimately ended up being negative. They're the things that are loosely held to the atom, as you can see from this model right here. Remember, they're out really far away and the positives are stuck together uh, by some other force. Notice they're all positives with neutrals. These are neutrons and protons. Uh, that's what the nucleus is. This is horribly out of scale, by the way, though. Uh, for instance, if you scaled up the nucleus of an atom till it was about the size of a grape seed, you know how small those are, they fit between your teeth, right? Uh, you could put this at the 50 yard line of the Washington football team stadium uh, and the electron orbits would be out beyond the parking lot. So that gives you an idea of how small the nucleus is compared to the rest of the atom. It's literally a factor of 10,000 uh, bigger. So it's not really a scale, but the main thing is these electrons are held to the positive charges because they're unlike charges uh, due to this Coulomb force and they're sort of loosely held. So it's a lot easier to dislodge them 
than it is to dislodge the positive charges. It turns out this force holding them together is something we call the strong nuclear force. And that strong nuclear force is way, 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 way stronger than the electric force, which is neat because the electric force is way, 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 way stronger than the gravitational force. Uh, so the electric force is actually really, really strong. Uh, you might say one with 20 zeros after it times stronger, or maybe even come up with like one with 40 zeros after it times stronger, depending on how you do your calculations. But uh, getting that started, let me uh, introduce you to Coulomb's law. And I'm gonna do it by solving this problem right here. So what is the force the electron in a hydrogen atom feels if it is in the ground state where the radius, the distance between the, pro, uh, between the single proton and the electron is R equal to R1, which is what we call the Bohr radius, 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. Okay, and then I ask, what is the force the proton experiences? So we're literally talking this innermost electron, it's out a distance of one Bohr radius, 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10th meters from the nucleus and the nucleus for a hydrogen atom is just a single proton. It doesn't have any neutrons unless it's uh, what we call deuterium or tritium. Deuterium actually has two neutrons and tritium has, uh, or excuse me, has one neutron and one proton. That's why it's called du because it's two particles. And tritium actually has two neutrons and one proton. That's why it's called tritium because there's three particles or three nucleons. Uh, either way, the charge, the, the force would be the same because really all that plays a role in the actual uh, electric force is the charges. The neutrons don't have any charge, so hence they can't give any more electrical force. Uh, they can give a little gravitational, but you'll see the gravitational force is way, way smaller. So uh, what is Coulomb's law? Well, Coulomb, Charles Coulomb actually did experiments, uh, sort of like the same experiments that were done with gravity, if y'all covered that last semester, uh, where you basically connect uh, sort of like that setup we just had in the electrostatic case. We had basically a mass on a rod and another mass on a rod. And uh, in this case, we'd actually put a charge Q on it. We charge it up, maybe it's made of amber and we rub some fur on it and we get a charge Q. And then we do that same thing to another object. And maybe this has a charge of Q as well. Only this one's hanging from a little ribbon of material, if you will, and it causes it to rotate around uh, because these two charges are repelled by one another. Uh, in doing so, maybe if we charge this one too, then that one would, and this one was charged, then that one would uh, supply even more so we could use an even smaller charge and get a bigger effect. But there's a very simple uh, engineering calculation that can be done with materials that tell by what angle it turns or rotates this fiber uh, for a given force. And from that, they were able to determine what the actual force was. What they discovered was that the force of attraction or repulsion, remember like charges repel and unlike charges attract, the force of attraction or repulsion was uh, directly related to, or proportional to is another way of saying it, is proportional to uh, the product of the charges. So the force, what we call a Coulomb force, is directly proportional to Q1 times Q2 where say this would be Q1 and this would be Q2. So for any two charges, the forces are directly proportional. That means if I double this charge, the force goes up by a factor of two. If I instead triple this charge, the force goes up by a factor of three. If I do both, meaning I double this one and I triple this one, the force will go up by a factor not of five, but two times three, which is six, okay? So that's the first discovery. Then they also discovered that the distance away mattered. And in fact, it was inversely related to the square of the distance away. So that was the uh, quantitative description, description of Coulomb's force law. Basically the force is directly proportional to the uh, product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the radius and I say radius, it's really just the distance between the individual point charges. Now, if it is truly a point charge, it's just from point to point, but if it's a spherical charge and the charge is distributed uniformly, it just goes from the center of the sphere to the center of the sphere, okay? It's a little more complicated if the shapes 
are not symmetric uh, or spherically symmetric or the charges aren't, aren't distributed uniformly that way. Uh, but you don't have to do that stuff. That's uh, more of a calculus-based physics course. So really, you just have to think about the distance between the centers and the product of the charges. Ultimately, when you do this experiment, you can actually get a value that makes this equal. Remember, when you say something's proportional to something, if you say y is proportional to x, you can write it like this, but if you want to make it into an equation, you say y equals some constant times x. And then you do an experiment to determine what that k is because you've got a value of x and a value of y for one experiment. And if you're really right about this being proportional, then this number has to be a constant every way you try it. Well, when they did that with this, they did use the, or we do use the value k, and it turned out that the Coulomb force was equal to k, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And the K is equal to 8.988 times 10 to the ninth. And the units turn out to be Newton times meter squared per Coulomb squared. Okay. Uh, we'll use a different constant later. You'll see there's a way of writing this K differently with another constant, but this is basically it. You can say it's approximately equal to 9.0 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared, and that works as well. So that is the actual Coulomb law. So let's work this problem. Let's actually solve what is the force the electron and the hydrogen atom feels. And this is the way you're going to solve your problems. They're vectors, right? But the vectorness comes in from the direction. And according to Coulomb's law, right now, we just have the magnitude. What the direction is, uh, the way the direction is decided is you do the magnitude and then you realize the force of attraction or repulsion always acts along the line connecting the centers of the charge. And then you just have to use whether it's a, uh, repelling it or attracting it to see which direction along that line. So we'll see that in a later example. But right now, we'll say that the force of attraction uh, or repulsion, in this case, is a positive charge, the proton, and a negative charge, the electron. So they're unlike charges, so they are attractive. It's going to be equal to 9.0 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared times, now the charge of the electron is actually negative but when we're using Coulomb's law, we don't put the charges in. We remember we're going to decide the direction by thinking about that line connecting them and whether it repels or attracts. So we always use the positive signs. So it'll be 1.6. Notice it's actually 1.602 is what I wrote earlier, but I'm only doing the two sig figs. So 1.6 times 10 to the negative, uh, a third, excuse me, negative 19th Coulombs. That is the unit of the charge, by the way, the Coulomb. That's a really big unit of charge. Uh, a typical lightning strike might only have a couple hundred coulombs, for instance. Uh, the charge of the proton is also 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, only it's positive, but again, we're not keeping any signs, period. And then we divide it by the square of the Bohr radius, which uh, was 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10th. I'm going to call it 0.53. So it's 0.53 times 10 to the negative 10th. Uh, meters and that quantity is squared and when I plug all this into my calculator I should get a very nice simple value it turns out to be roughly 8.2 times 10 to the negative ninth I think 10 to the negative ninth. yeah 10 to the negative 8 excuse me 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons So that's our first experience uh, using Coulomb's law. Now, if I were to replace this uh, nucleus, instead of having just one proton, if I replaced it with two protons, which by definition, that makes it helium now, not hydrogen, uh, then that force would be twice as big because I just doubled the charge. That's what the force being proportional to the charge means, is if I double one of these charges, then I double the force. So in fact, the force of attraction, if the distance stayed the same, and it doesn't, by the way, for helium, but if the distance stayed the same uh, and I replaced one of the protons uh, with two protons, uh, then I would get 16.4 times in the negative eight newtons. Uh, any questions on that?
Okay. Well, we've gone about uh, more than 50 minutes now, so I think this is another good time for you guys to take a break. Uh, and then we'll, uh, I'm going to give you, let's say, I'll give you a 20 minute break this time. Oh my God. What's that? Najay, did you ask me a question, bud? Okay. Oh, no, I didn't. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Well, we're going to take a break till, uh, let's do 1140 this time. So I'm going to give you a full 20 minute break so you can absorb any of this. And I'm going to go ahead and pause everything. And I'll probably kill the video for a while. But uh, y'all go ahead and come back at 1140. And we'll finish off the rest of chapter 16 that we're doing today. Okay, so yeah, we had a question regarding the last example we just worked and a student wanted me to uh, rediscuss what we went over. So uh, here is the question is, what is the force the electron in a hydrogen atom feels if it is in the ground state R equal R1? So ground state and all that wording, that stuff you're not supposed to know yet. That's just me telling you what the wording that you'll expect <laughs> to see is. Uh, but basically we have sort of this atom but instead of having these you know, multiple electrons, I'm just gonna have one orbit with one electron in it and one proton down here, no neutrons, just one proton. And the distance between, on average, the distance between the center of this proton, which is essentially infinitesimally small, uh, to the center of this electron, which is evidently infinitely small, is one Bohr radius, and that quantity is 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. So that's something that, that we would give you. Uh, you don't have to know this off the top of your head. Uh, if you're taking a two semester course in a regular semester, they might expect you to have that memorized, but not, not here, okay. Uh, the, both of them, the electron and the, posit uh, and, and the proton have the same charge. They're just opposite in sign. So the electron's charge is negative, the uh, proton's charge is positive, and that charge is what we call a quantum of charge, uh, or the electron charge is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So that's the charges we use. We now have the distance and the charges, and that's all we need for Coulomb's law, because Coulomb's law is basically K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. So I just need to know the separation between the two charges, the charge of one and the charge of the other, and I can get the magnitude as long as I know what this K is. So that's what we're gonna do here, is we're gonna plug in these values. The K, I'm using two sig figs, so I just, reverted back to 9.0 times 10 to the ninth instead of 8.988. So the force is going to be 9.0 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. The charge of one of them, say the electron, is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th Coulombs. The charge of the other one, say the proton, is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th Coulombs again. So you see this Coulomb times this Coulomb gives you a Coulomb squared. That's going to cancel out with that down there. So I'm left with Newton meter squared. But then this uh, Bohr radius, the R equals R1, is 0.53 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. And since it goes like R squared, that's going to make meters squared. So that's going to cancel out the meter squared. And it does, in fact, leave me a Newton. So in fact, uh, the uh, attractive force between the proton and the electron is 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8 newton, uh, newtons. I don't know where a newton came from, <laughs> but uh, that's basically attractive force. The other part of the question is what is the force the proton experiences? And uh, if you look at this, uh, we just calculated the force that the electron experiences. Uh, all you do if you wanted to uh, figure out the force of proton experiences is you'd flip those two because that's the only difference in them. Uh, but again, they're the same number anyways. And even if you did flip them, if one was two and the other one's three, the answer is still six. So because uh, multiplication is commutative, uh, basically the force is the same on the electron as it is on the proton, which you also already knew from Newton's third law. Newton's third law says the force uh, of one object on another is equal to the negative of the force of the other object on the one. Uh, F12 equals negative F21. Uh, so that's basically Newton's third law. So we should have known that already, but you can see Coulomb's law bears that out. Does that help you? Does that make any sense? All right, it's about time to get back started. So does anybody have any questions again before we get started back up? I, uh, during the break, I had a, 
a couple students asked uh, a couple questions about the last example and I re went over it. So when y'all look at the video, if you need to, you'll find in that little intermission, you'll find a, a chance to uh, see a recap of that example. So uh, y'all can check that out. But does anybody else have any other questions before I get started on the next example? All right, looks like we're good to go then. So uh, what I'm going to do now is another example. Like I said, I, I, I make up my own examples, uh, but they're somewhat like the ones in, in just about every textbook. So uh, by me making up my own example, you actually get more examples in general. So I, I think that's a, a helpful scenario. Uh, plus your book, normally when it gives you an example, it normally gives you another exercise immediately thereafter that's like it. So, uh, and they have answers to that as well. So with all those different problems that you can have a chance to see work and then work with comparing to the right answer, you should get plenty of practice that way. So that's really the way you succeed in a physics course is you see an example and then you try to work an example that that's like it or maybe a slight difference. So it's a little more complicated. And then uh, ultimately you get more and more complicated. Uh, the more experience you have, you can do more and more complicated problems. So let's start with the next problem. So I'm going to switch to my document cam. So what we have here is three charges along the line. Uh, basically we have a negative charge separated by 20 centimeters from a positive charge, which is separated by another 10 centimeters from a negative charge. And I want you to calculate the, or I want us to calculate the net force on charge Q3. Okay. Uh, generally uh, they'll just state these with micro coulombs or nano coulombs or something like that. Like I told you a coulomb is a really big unit of charge but I wanted to remind you, you are sort of expected to know those uh, prefixes, micro, nano, pico, all that good stuff. Uh, so make sure you're up to speed with those. Uh, in this case, I went ahead and wrote the micro coulomb after the fact and just showed that a micro is 10 to the negative six, meaning one millionth. Uh, so you see 0.111 times 10 to the negative six coulombs, which is 0.111 micro coulombs. This one's negative 4.0 uh, micro coulombs, and this one's negative 1.0 1 micro coulombs. So the way we're going to work this is we realize these are uh, vector forces, and really uh, the vector forces uh, uh, basically allow us to use a principle of superposition. This is different than the superposition that you learn about in geology. The superposition basically says, hey, if you have uh, one object applying a force to another object, that's just a force. But if you have two objects applying a force to one object, then each of those has a separate force and we can just add those and that'll be the same as if it's just one big force. Uh, so basically uh, you only add up the forces that are acting on the object uh, as vectors and then the net result is, the, is basically the right answer. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at Q3 and I'm going to use a, a notation that's a, a little different. It's really good to use double subscripts. So what I'll say is the force, notice I'm using a single subscript here, the force on three uh, really is the net force on, on object three. That's equal to the force on three due to one. So I'll write it that way, the force on object three due to object one is F31 plus the force on object three due to two. That's the total force on three. And that's basically what I mean when I write just a single subscript, I'm saying, hey, what's the total force? Another way you could write it is just the summation of all the forces on three or something like that. Uh, in which case you put a little sigma there, but I'm just writing it like this. So I need to know uh, the forces on uh, Q3 due to one, and then the forces on Q3 due to two, I'm gonna first calculate their magnitudes and then think about their direction. So first off, let me calculate the force on three due to one in magnitude. I'm gonna use two sig figs because that's what we used here. I used three here and you'll see why in a second I'm trying to make the math easy so we don't have to use calculators. Uh, but basically the force on uh, three due to one is roughly 9.0 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Now uh, we need the charge of Q3, which is again, we drop the negative signs. We never use the negatives in our Coulomb's law. And that's 1.0 times 10 to the negative six Coulombs times, now that was three, now I need one, that's 4.0 
times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And all that, the distance between them, notice, is 0.1 plus 0.2, or that 0 0.3 meters, and we've got to square it. Well, I think you might be able to see what's happening already. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the 9 here divided by 0.3 squared. 0.3 squared is going to become 0.09. So that's actually going to get rid of the 9. So I'm ultimately going to have uh, basically 4 to some power, 4 times 10 to some power, uh, because all the 9s cancel out. That's why I, I chose the distance of 0.3. That's why I chose a charge of 0.111. But when you actually put it in your calculator, you'll see that the ultimate answer uh, you get uh, is uh -oh. Sorry, I just lost something. Uh, there it is. Okay, the ultimate answer you're going to get is 0.4 newtons. So that's the force uh, on Q3 as a result of Q1. Now, if I look up here and realize, okay, Q1 and Q3 are both negative charges, so that's a repulsive force. So I expect uh, the F31 to point to the right. It's like uh, F, uh, Q3 is being pushed away from Q1. So that's F31, and I'll put it right there. So that's how I'm going to evaluate the direction of this vector, okay? I uh, see that it's pointing to the right. These are all along one line. Uh, I would normally call that horizontal line the x-axis, and I would call the right the positive direction. So I would call this a force of positive 0 0.40 newtons. Since it's one dimension, that should be the same as a vector. So, because a vector in one dimension is really just a positive or negative sign defining the distance of uh, the direction. Now, the other force I need is F32. Uh, so, F32 is equal to 9.0 times 10 to the ninth uh, Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Now, charge Q3 is again. Uh, 1.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs and charge Q2 is 0 0.111 and the reason I use 0.111 if you guys are up to speed on your basic arithmetic you remember that 1 over 9 is 0.1111111 going on for infinity so this being 9 and this being 1 over 9 is kind of nice. It means they cancel each other out. That's why I chose the 0 0.111. I do that a lot. I try to do stuff like that so I don't have to actually uh, do the calculations with a calculator. The distance, on the other hand, is 0 0.10 between the 2 and the 3. So this one becomes 0 0.10. And since it's 1, 0 meters, that's just going to become a 1 when you square it. Of course, it's going to be a 0 0.01. Uh, but basically, in, when all of this is said and done, you're going to get 0 0.10 newtons. I barely fit it on the page there, but that's basically uh, the magnitude of that force. I'll write it down here again since it's so hard to read. It's 0 0.10 newtons. Uh, Are you saying that the point zero, I mean 0 0.1 mm -hmm. on the bottom, is that one supposed to be squared? Yes, thank you. Nice catch. I completely forgot to write it. I think I said it. Might not have used. Yeah, I did say it because I said 0 0.01. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's definitely supposed to be squared. Nice catch. Thank you. Thank and you. I always do that, folks. It, 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 I'm definitely going to make boo-boos, so it will help if you guys uh, point those out to me. Now, we've got the magnitude of the two forces. I also have to do the direction of that force. Now, the force Q2 is actually positive, and the force Q3 is actually negative, so they actually attract one another. So Q3 actually feels an affinity uh, for uh, Q1. So uh, Q3 is actually going to be pulled this way. And I should technically uh, draw them somewhat to scale. I didn't mess with that at all here. But you see the main point is 3, 2 would be pointing to the left, and 3, 1 would be pointing to the right. Uh, so they're basically being uh, subtracted, if you will. So when they become subtracted, uh, basically, the, the one with the biggest magnitude wins the sign war. In this case, the one with the biggest magnitude is the F31. So the 0.4 wins the sign war, which means the resultant is going to point to the right. So the net force, F3, is in fact equal to 0.4 minus 0.1, because 
minus 0.1 means moving to the, uh, pointing to the left is 0 0.30 newtons to the right. Does that make sense? Okay, so see how I did that? The, the big thing here is when you're using Coulomb's law, right from the get-go, you want to use Coulomb's law, which is, let me write it over here for a refresher. F is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Uh, you want to use it just in terms of magnitude. Get rid of all the signs, plug all the numbers in, get how big the force is, and then think about the direction. Once you think about the direction, you can either use trigonometry, or in this case, I just use a sign, and that sign would actually give me uh, the actual direction in the case of one-dimensional motion, or one-dimensional vectors. So in this case, I could actually assign the sign by doing that, just putting a little negative in front of it. Okay? So when I add 0.4 and negative 0.1, I get 0 0.3. And since it came out positive, I know it points to the right, and I just further indicated that by writing the word right, okay? So remember that it seems weird because there's a formula and I asked for charge, and the charge is negative, and the other charge is positive, and you want to definitely multiply a negative and a positive because it's clearly what the charge is, but no, you don't want to do that at all with Coulomb's law. You just want to uh, put in the signs of, everything, of the charges, in other words, positives, and multiply it all out, get an answer, and then we'll use vectors to figure out uh, exactly what the uh, force is. So what I'm going to do now is do one in two dimensions. So this is a little more fancy, if you will, but we're going to do a two-dimensional vector problem. And what I'm going to do is draw an XY coordinate system. You don't have to do this from the get-go, but I'm doing it just to make sure everybody's on the same page. We're going to treat X as positive to the right, we're going to treat y as positive uh, pointing up, and that's usually what I do, but not always. I am going to put a charge right here. I'm going to put a charge, uh, let's call that one Q1. I'm going to say Q1 is actually equal to, uh, let's see, I'm going to say 20 microcoulombs, and I'm going to call it positive. And then I'm going to say over here is a charge Q2. And that's also on this axis. This is charge Q2. And this one's going to be a negative 50 microcoulombs. And that's going to be a distance away of, let's say, 40 centimeters. And I'm going to treat that as two sig figs, even though it looks like it's one because I didn't put a decimal after it. And I'm going to say this one up here is going to be three, 30 centimeters away. And I'm going to actually give me a positive charge up there as well. And this will be Q3. And this Q3, let's call this one... Uh, I'll call this one, let's say this one's going to be a positive, let's say a positive four, 40 microcoulombs. Okay. So what I want to know is what is the net force on Q3? So my question is, Okay, now it's a force, and remember, force are vector quantities, so I can't just give the magnitude. I actually have to give the direction and all that good stuff. That's the nature of it, unless I explicitly tell you you don't have to give the magnitude. If I ask for a vector quantity, then you need to give me the magnitude and direction, uh, not just the magnitude. So uh, unless I explicitly tell you you have to give me the magnitude and direction, not just the magnitude. I think I said uh, the wrong thing a second ago, so I want to make sure you all <laughs> follow that. So uh, this is kind of a very typical triangle, by the way. Uh, it's going to come in handy because I need to calculate, to calculate the force F, F3. I know that F3 is equal to F 
three, one, meaning the force on three due to one, plus F three, two. Notice it's the same formula we got before. That's the force on three due to two, right? So in order to do three one, I got to add the distance between force three uh, between charge three and charge one, which I see that's clearly 30 centimeters. Easy peasy, right? However, the force three two is I've got to add the distance between particle Q3 and particle Q2. Well, that's this distance. Well, I just happen to know this wonderful triangle that we're pretending uh, we don't know. And that is, in fact, has a hypotenuse of 50 centimeters. It's the three, four, five triangle. So whenever you have two perpendiculars, one is a multiple of three and the other one's a multiple of four, then you know whatever the multiple is there, like if this is three times three, it would be nine, and that would make this four times three would be 12. So this would be, again, uh, three times five, which would be 15. In this case, the multiple is just 10, so it's three, four, five. So I now know that distance right there, uh, easy enough, so I don't have to really mess with the Pythagorean theorem that, that terribly. Of course, you still can. It's just I try to choose triangles that make life a little easier. So again, what we're going to do is calculate the magnitude of the forces, and then we're going to use uh, that magnitude and our ideas about vectors and figure out exactly uh, what the actual vector force is because, you know, if they're not parallel or anti-parallel, they don't just add like positive and negative numbers. They go through some stuff. So let's look at F31 first. Uh, F31 is going to be 9 times 10 to the ninth. I'm not even writing the extra sig fig here. Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Uh, the charge on Q3 is 40 microcoulombs, so it's 40 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And the charge on Q1 is uh, 20 microcoulombs, so times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. Over the distance between 3 and 1, that's 0 0.30. Notice how I had to switch it to meters. I gave it to you in centimeters. That's a typical trick that a instructor will do just to make sure you remember that, oh, I, everything has to be in our base units, except for the kilogram, of course, because the base unit is the kilogram, even though it's got a prefix of a kilo in it. So when I do this math, I've got to now uh, multiply 9 times 10 to the ninth times 40 times 10 to the 6, negative 6, excuse me, times 20 times 10 to the negative 6, And then I gotta, gotta divide that by 0.3 squared. And I get eight Newtons. That's F31. I also need F32. I think I can write it right here. F32 is also gonna be nine times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Three is again 40 times 10 to the negative six coulombs. Uh, two in this case is 50. Notice I'm dropping the negatives again, 50 times 10 to the negative six coulombs. Over in this case, it's gonna be 0 0.50 meters and that's gonna be squared. So in this case, I'm gonna do nine, 10 to the ninth times 40, 10 to the negative six times 50, 10 to the negative six. And I'm gonna divide that by 0.5 squared. And in that case, I get 72. Newtons. Okay. So that's the two forces, but we don't know necessarily what the directions are. So we can't just automatically add 72 and eight, you know, it's real tempting to write 80 right now. Right. Uh, but that's not what we're going to do. What we first got to do is figure out what are the directions of F31 and F32. 
Well, F31 is the force of attraction or repulsion between three and one. Now, Coulomb's law comes with it the extra rule that the direction is always along the line that connects the center of charge three with charge one. So it's somewhere along this line. Then we got to say, well, like charges repel and unlike charges attract. Well, these are both positive, so they're like charges, they repel. So Q3 is actually being pushed upward. That's a positive direction. So I'm going to draw it as a red vector and call that F31. Okay. So that's F31. <coughs> And now I've got to do F32. Now F32 is between charge three and charge two. So it's somewhere along this line, or it's pointing one direction along this line. Now Q2 is negative and Q3 is positive. So they're attractive, which means that <coughs> in fact, uh, this direction is neither in the X or the Y direction. So I'm going to just color it blue, but I know it's along this line. And since they're attractive, it's pulling or acting like it's trying to pull Q3 this way. So this is F32. So I now know the direction of that. Well, sort of. Uh, I know it's along the hypotenuse of this 345 triangle, which if you actually remember your 345 triangle, uh, many of you probably don't, I'm sure, and, that, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but if I wanted to find this angle, for instance, I take the inverse tangent of 30 over 40. So, uh, actually, I realize this calculator I'm using is quite complicated and it's hard to find. The oh, there's the trig function. Gotcha. So, I'm going to say tangent inverse inner, and I'm going to say 30 over 40, which obviously would be three over four would be fine as well. And that's 36.9 degrees. So this angle is 36.9 degrees roughly. Or more uh, usefully is this other one over here is 53.1 degrees. So that one being right there helps me as well. So now what I can do is I can realize, okay, well, it's gonna have a positive X component pointing this way. And it will in fact have a negative Y component that points this way. So this is uh, F32 sub Y. And this is F32 sub X. Meaning that's the X component drawn as an actual vector. That's the Y component drawn as an actual vector. So remember the rules with adding vectors is once you have them into component form, like components add. So if you uh, find all the Y components, you just add them up as positive and negative numbers. And if you find all the X components, you just add all them up as positive and negative numbers. Uh, and then you have two mutually perpendicular answers, the X component and the Y component, one being parallel or anti-parallel to the X axis and the other one being parallel or anti-parallel to the Y axis. And then you use Pythagorean theorem to find out their magnitude. So that's what we're going to do now. Uh, what we see here is F31 is purely in the Y direction. So F31 Y is in fact the same thing as F31. So what this means is F31 sub Y is equal to the magnitude of F31, which we found was 8.0 newtons. And F31X is actually equal to zero newtons. Now, let's think a second about breaking up these components. We're gonna have to talk about a triangle here. So what I'm gonna do is imagine a neat little triangle and this triangle has a side of length F32 Y and it has another side of length F32 X and it has a hypotenuse whose length is in fact 72 Newtons and we know this angle is 53.1. Now, don't be shy about this. I know that's really hard to see. That's a 53.1. It's the same triangle as this. Uh, don't be shy about writing out all your trig functions. 
okay? It's really easy to get confused with which function is which. Like a lot of students just automatically say, well, the cosine gives me the X component. Well, that's not true at all in this example because I'm using that angle. You know, the cosine only gives you the X if you measure it counterclockwise from the positive X axis and it gets really complicated. But by allowing us to just do any angle anywhere, we just have to go back and check and make sure our components are the right ones using the right trig functions and then assigning the right signs. So that's why I drew this one green and this one red. So I'll remember, oh, that one's a negative Y component and this one's a positive X component. So right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, uh, sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So sine 53.1, is equal to opposite, which would be 3, 2x, over hypotenuse, which would be the 72 newtons. And I'll write down the cosine as well. This is what I mean by don't be shy about writing all the trig functions. The cosine of 53.1, again, degrees, in this case, is equal, as always, co cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. I use some old horse came a hopping through our alley, and some people use Sokotoa, but anyways, some old horse came a hopping through our alley. Adjacent over hypotenuse, adjacent means it's actually touching the angle, so that's F3, 2Y, and the hypotenuse, of course, is again 72 newtons. So now I can see uh, how I'm gonna actually find the uh, X component. I'm gonna multiply 72 newtons times the sine, and the Y component, I'm gonna multiply 72 times the cosine but the Y is actually negative, so I gotta remember to put a negative sign on it. So let's do that now. We're gonna say uh, F32X is equal to positive, cause it's already a positive, 72 Newtons times the sine of 53.1. Now technically you don't even have to go to that. You know what the sine of 53.1 is. 53.1 sine is 40 over 50 or four fifths. But anyways, I'm gonna do it uh, with my calculator because I know you guys are normally doing it with your calculator as well. Ooh, well, my calculator uh, lost, died the battery or something. So now I'm gonna do 72 times trig function sine, in this case, 53.1. And this should be four fifths of 72. And I do get that. Uh, in fact, it's 57.6 newtons. Okay. So that's my F32X. My F32Y is just going to be, and I know I'm running down on the page, so I'm going to try to keep it where you guys can see it. Now, in this case, it's going to be a negative because it was green, remember? So it's a negative 72 newtons. times the cosine of 53.1 degrees. And so now I do 72 times cosine cosine 53.1. So this is gonna be 43.2, so that's a negative 43.2 Newtons. All right, so now F3, remember that's the total vector, that's the total force, F3, uh, its X component is in fact going to be F31 sub X plus F32 sub X but as we found, F31 sub X is zero, and F32 sub X is 57.6, so it's zero Newtons plus 57.6 Newtons, which we only started with two sig figs, so I sh should technically have called that 58, but I'm gonna keep that extra sig fig until I get the angle. So uh, this is gonna be 57.6 Newtons, and I'll underline that just to remind me that that sig fig is not appropriate. Uh, the F3 sub Y will be F3 1 sub Y plus F3 2 sub Y. 
Well, F31 sub y is basically all of F31. So that's eight Newtons. And then F32 sub y is negative 43.2 Newtons. So ultimately my result is going to be a negative and that should be 35.2. So negative 35.2 Newtons. So I'm almost done. I have the two magnitudes. In fact, if we were using that uh, IJK notation that some books use, you, you could write it down right now like that, but that's not what we do usually in the algebra-based physics. Uh, we usually use magnitudes and directions. So I'm going to plot this roughly real quick just to see what it's going to look like. So I'll put an x-axis and a y-axis like this. There's my y, there's my x. And what I have is a negative y component and a positive x component. And in fact, the x component is quite big. So I'm going to draw that like this. And then the negative y component is a little bit smaller. So I'm going to say maybe like this. This one's 35.2. And this one's uh, 40, excuse me, 57.6 Newtons in both cases. So when you have vectors that are tail to tail, uh, you have to add them by completing the parallelogram. So I complete the parallelogram by drawing something parallel to this side and then drawing something parallel to this side and then drawing from the common base to the opposite diagonal side. And that's the new F3. So that is the force F3 and I can get its magnitude. I think you can all tell since these are perpendicular, I'm gonna get it by taking the uh, using the Pythagorean theorem. I'm gonna uh, do that by using the Pythagorean theorem. I'm gonna do 57.6 squared plus uh, 35.2 squared. And then I'm gonna take the square root of all that junk. So I'm gonna do And that turns out to be magnitude of F3 is 67.5 Newtons. Again, that's an extra sig fig that I'm not supposed to be having, so I left it underlined. Now, if I want the magnitude, I can treat the magnet, I mean the direction, I can treat the direction as this little angle right here, and I just take the inverse uh, tangent of 35.2 over 57.6. So uh, that angle right there, which I'll call theta, theta is equal to the tangent inverse of 35.2 over 57.6. And that should give me 0.5. Missed the wrong trig function again, darn it. I really just like this calculator that I'm using. A friend gave it to me and it's, you gotta do a bunch of stuff to get to the trig functions. So I'm gonna do 35.2 divided by 57.6 and I get 31.4 degrees. So what we would say about this force is that the force has a magnitude of 67.5 Newtons and it acts at 31.4 degrees below horizontal. Okay. So in fact, it sort of acts this direction. Actually, it'd probably be a little bit less, maybe that direction right there. So that's the direction Q3 would move if uh, we let it go. It would tend to fall off like this way or something. We know that's 53. Uh, from here to here. So this one must be 36. So it's a little bit smaller than this angle. Okay. Any questions on that? That's a lot of stuff, but that's a very typical vector type problem that you you guys got to be able to do. I, I, I'm sorry. I keep using the phrase guys. It's, I guess I'm still in high school. You folks, are you people, are you students? <laughs> okay. So this is the problem you have to do. You have to be able to do is uh, actually 
combining vectors and doing that sort of stuff. Notice it's not that hard to calculate the magnitude, but then the trick is figuring out uh, which direction does it point. And then that's all that is, is always along the line connecting the two charges that you calculated the force for. So for instance, when I did three one, that's a charge three and that's a charge one. So it had to be along this line. Since those two were uh, positive, both positive, they repelled. So Q3 wants to get away from it. So I know it's vertical along that line, that line. Uh, in the case of 3-2, Q2 is negative and Q3 is positive. So they're attractive. I know it's got to be along that diagonal right there. And since they're attractive, Q3 is wanting to be pulled that way. So uh, I then drew it parallel to that triangle's Circum I mean, to that triangle's hypotenuse, which told me this angle is 53.1. I was then able to use my trig functions to calculate the individual parts. Does that make sense? All right, well, we went a little over in our uh, lecture time, and that's just, that's fine because we're going actually into lab now. The good news is our lab is a breeze. Uh, you can do this completely on your own. You don't have to stay online or anything. I'm going to give you a little intro to it, and then I'll let you guys go, and you'll be done for the day. I don't think anybody's going to object to that, are we? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, so uh, let me change the camera real quick. Oh, I just turned it completely off like a goober. Uh, let me do this, change the camera real quick, so you can look at my ugly mug. Uh, what we're going to do is do a share screen. And I'm going to go back to here. And I'm going to share that screen. And I'm going to escape the full screen version. Uh, what I want to do is go to this module. And you'll look, first one is all that stuff that I said generic comes from the college, then the course documents. Next is the lab. So this is your lab. OK. You've got to download it. You've got to have Word. I can put up a PDF version, but you probably won't the Word version uh, because the Word version allows you to fill it in in the actual document, whereas a PDF wouldn't. If you don't currently have the latest copy of Word, you're given free access to that through TCC. So uh, you can just download it uh, and use it on your own computer. As long as you're a TCC student, that'll be active. Uh, you might have it from your other college if you go somewhere else, or if you're already a TCC student, you should have it. Uh, but you're going to open this up, and basically all you're doing is uh, learning how to use the spreadsheet. If you guys finished uh, 201 last semester or even the semester before at TCC, you know how to do this. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You've already done this lab before. Uh, all you have to do is complete it and then turn in the pages with all the answers. That's why I gave it to you in, in Word form. So in word form, uh, you can actually type in the answers into the, the uh, boxes and everything, and you can just submit that to me. So uh, right here in the uh, week one folder, there will be something called uh, lab one spreadsheet review, and that will be where you turn in that lab. Does anybody have any questions on that? What time do we have to turn in the lab by? Uh, by lab next meeting, which is Wednesday. Thank you. So make sure you get it finished by 930, even though lab don't start till noon. But make sure you get it finished by 930, because I'd hate for you to not pay attention during the lecture portion. OK? So how do we turn in the lab? Uh, that's what I was saying. There will be a link just like it'll look just like this, but it'll have a, like a little piece of paper with the corners uh, fold it over and that'll have this more or less the same name as this and you just click on it and it lets you upload any uh, certain kinds of documents. Uh, if you uh, don't want to do a Word version, I prefer actually a PDF. So even if you fill it out in Word, do save as instead of save and it gives you the option to save it as a PDF. Save it as that because a lot of people put viruses in Word documents. We haven't mm -hmm. had as much problem with that as PDF, so I prefer a PDF. But if you have to put up a docx, that's fine. Uh, put it in there, but you just submit it that way. Uh, if if you don't like that way, you can even take single uh, screenshot or shots of it with your computer, a screenshot using Command Shift Three on a Mac, or using the Snip 
uh, snipping tool. It's called a snipping tool. See right there. So if you do a search for that in your Windows system, uh, you'll pull that up. You can do a screenshot of it and turn in the individual photographs. That would be fine. But most people just turn in uh, a PDF document of this. Does that make sense? In fact, watch this. I'll, I'll go ahead and make this so you'll see it. I'm going to say a new assignment. Lab one. Say add item. In case you're down here, I'll have this. I'll publish it and make sure you be able to see it. Now I click on it and it'll allow me to uh, do more options and I'll set it where y'all can turn this in. So this is what it looks like. Notice that it looked like a little piece of paper. This is something you would never see this edit part. But what I want to do is say, this is worth a hundred points. It's an assignment. Uh, submission is online. Uh, you can type it in a text entry. Definitely don't do that. That'd be insane. Uh, you can do a website or you can do a file upload. I again prefer PDFs. Okay, so remember this is due beginning of next lab. So just make sure you have it finished by 930 on Wednesday. Uh, but now you can look actually not in assignments, you look in modules and you'll see this in week one. Spreadsheet review. Okay, that's where you'll turn it in. I'm going to go ahead and turn on this because I've given you enough information to do those concepts. I thought I was going to have enough time to actually ask you them, so I might next time, but they're there if you want to play. Make sure you understand the concepts, uh, and you guys are done for today. Bro. Is that nice? <laughs> All right. Well, y'all have a good one. If anybody wants to stay after and ask questions, I'll stop recording, uh, but either way, you're still uh, free to go uh, otherwise. Enjoyed having you. See you next time, everybody.